All right, folks. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the rules committee meeting that just took place. Um, the rules committee has uh, undergone a little bit of a change this past year. Um, at last year's meeting, it was determined to uh, shrink the committee a little bit. It was previously designed of, of 11 members. It was brought down to seven members now. Uh, there's a D1 elected teams rep. You know, just like the president of the United States, we go through an election process. Uh, teams, uh, uh, we accept nominees. Uh, people, candidates step up and say, hey, I'm interested in this position. They, they run for it. The, the members of Division One voted and they um, uh, crowned the, they elected Dan Iavarone um, from Tulane as the D1 rules rep. So he's a, a officer for one of our, for Tulane, obviously, and he now sits on this panel uh, representing the D1 teams. Chad Lowe, the head coach of Ohio State, uh, was elected to the D2 uh, as the D2 rep. And uh, they, they serve two year terms, and the D2 rules committee representative is up for election this fall. No idea yet if Chad intends to rerun. Uh, for a re-election or if there'll be a new candidate, but uh, stay tuned. Christian and Eric will have that information out uh, once we get through the scheduling process and, and into the fall, we'll start looking at who's going to be the new uh, D2 Rules Committee representative for uh, the 2019 meeting. Uh, again, the, the committee is made up of seven members. It's the, the head of Division One, the head of Division Two, and the head of Division Three. That's Christian, Eric, and Garrett. And then uh, myself, I'm on the committee. And then uh, the the D1 and D2 elected officials, and then at the D1 level where we used to have all the regional direct D1 regional directors on the committee, we've now shrunk that down to just one. And the D1 regional directors uh, each year pick one of their um, members or one of the regional directors to serve and and uh, uh, vote on their behalf for the committee. And that this year that was Ryan Norris representing the Gulf Coast. Uh, Larry wants to know if the coaching staff has to be involved with the school or can they be volunteers? They can be volunteers. That's that's the school's discretion. Um, so the committee met on the 28th to discuss, debate, vote, and uh, establish any changes that happen to the, the rule book from, from the 18th season moving forward to the 2019 season. Throughout the, the year, uh, this meeting, this committee – meets just once a year, but all year long, they're collecting uh, information from the teams, proposed rule changes and things of that nature. Um, so what the, throughout the year, the way the process worked, teams would either contact Christian or Eric or maybe their regional director, or, or they'd go straight to their, their specific uh, uh, division elected official and propose changes. Hey, this is, we want to, we, we'd like to see this proposed as a change. Here's why. Give their reasoning to it. Um, everything that a team has brought up over the course of the entire year was discussed at that, at some level at that meeting. Now, not everything got voted upon. Sometimes, you know, someone, you know, maybe let's say the D2 rep would stand up and say, Hey, a team proposed this. I don't support it. Nobody else in the room supported it. It just, it just got moved on. Uh, it wasn't even, uh, uh, it didn't get a, you know, a single person in the committee that, that supported that change. And so, no vote was taken. Now we're going to discuss uh, some of the things we did vote upon or did you know did discuss. Um, um, some one of the things that was proposed is we currently have a rule that you know moving players from D one to D two or you're limited to three. Um, it was propo proposed that that be changed that instead of moving a player up or down that they can be dual rostered um, both on a. This is for schools that have both a D1 and a D2 team, such as Penn State, Ohio State, Illinois, Grand Canyon, Arizona State, those kind of teams where they have uh, a Division One and Division Two team. Instead of only being limited to three moves, they'd be allowed to have three players rostered on both teams. So basically a kid could play on Saturday on the D1 club team, Sunday on the D2 club team, next weekend on the D1 team. Um, that did not get approved at the D1 level. It did get approved at the D2 to D3 level. So for a school that has a D2 club and a D3 club, they could have three players that are dual rostered on both teams. This was uh, got support at this level because with D3 being so much more about developmental, developing schools, developing the team, uh, we thought it would be a, an opportunity where if a school had enough guys to form a D3 team also, 
um, but were like a little short, they could have three guys from their D2 team also be on the D3 team just to give them enough uh, bodies to continue to play. Um, uh, one of the things in the rules um, that, we, that, was, uh, that was approved was for conferences made comprised of only three teams that they would play in their, their conference schedule would consist of a three game away series and a three game home series. Um, in the past, it was set up for three team conferences that they would play a three game series and a four game series, vice versa, like maybe three on the road, four at home versus an opponent and, by, and, and switch the next year. That was approved. We don't have too many three team conferences. I don't foresee we'll ever have them again in division one or division two, but it's very possible as division three expands into the future. Um, there was a proposal to uh, the change. Christian talked earlier about how we put a rule into place last year that uh, you're allowed no more than four non-rostered personnel in the dugout at any time. It was proposed that that be increased to five. That did not get approved, so that will stay at four. Um, one of the things that was clarified that was, that was brought up this past season uh, was you know if if one of those non rostered personnel, assuming they're a coach, were to get ejected, can the team bring another non ron non rostered personnel member into the dugout to replace that one of the four that got ejected? And the answer is no. Yeah, uh, the next game you could let's say that person received a suspension, couldn't couldn't uh, serve in the next game. For that next game, you could then bring in a fourth non-rostered uh, dugout personnel. But for the remainder of that game following the ejection, now you're down to three non-rostered dugout personnel allowed. Um, for courtesy runners for the catcher with two outs in an inning, um, it was proposed that we add courtesy runners to the D1 level. That was unanimously shot down. Um, one of the other things that was brought up was to remove the re-entry rule at the Division II level, and that was approved. So moving forward at D2, there will no longer be re-entry rules. So that is a, that is a big change. Um, so D2 teams, you know, you know, put your thinking caps on, your managerial caps on, and realize you know, now that you make changes, when you pull a guy out, he's done for the rest of that game. A um, little piece of uh, housekeeping in regards to, our, you know, for years, our official uniform, we have the official cap, the game. Everybody has to wear the game. Everybody has to have the NCBA logo on the on that game cap to be, you know, le uniform legal on the field. Um, one of the things that was uh, approved unanimously was to make it mandatory that that NCBA logo be centered on the back of the hat as well as be a specific size, which will be listed in the rule book. Um, uh, the reason this was uh, it was sort of assumed before but we found some teams were going outside and getting the NCBA logo put on the side of the hat or they'd get it put up in in a rather large fashion that almost looked like a gaudy billboard uh, we're trying to create a uniform clean crisp NCBA look on the, all the headwear it really looks great when it's done right and so we, we just officially uh, documented in the rule book that it does have to be centered in the back of the hat and be this uh, specific size that everybody else is wearing. Uh, with every, with every you know, type of rule like this, what's the consequence for a violation? It was determined uh, that if the logo is in the wrong spot, a team that is found having the game hat, they still have the right hat, still have the NCBA logo on it, but it's the wrong size or it's in the wrong location, um, and they're caught using that, then they, they lose their performance bond. Um, regarding protests, one of the items that came up regarding protests, we, a few years ago we changed to the, uh, uh, the, the protest rules regarding roster violations. Previously it was, you know, at the time that you detect that there's a roster violation, at that moment you have to protest or you lose your chance to protest. We changed it a few years ago that you know, you you now have to file the protest before the first pitch. So if they hand you a, ro a lineup card at, at pregame, and there's somebody on, listed on it that's not on the roster, um, you'd have you, that was your only opportunity to to file the protest for the game. Uh, what was changed about that was basically basically the the flaw in that was that if a team A was using an illegal player and you didn't find out about it till 
say the second pitch of the game or the second inning, technically that player was legal to play the remainder of the game. Um, the committee discussed and debated it and we agreed like, hey, you know, you should have checked this before the first pitch. But at the same time, once it's identified, that guy shouldn't be allowed to continue to play the game. So now the way the rule is, um, the player is found, is found ineligible after the first pitch. He and the manager for that team are automatically ejected for the remainder of the game. However, everything that that player has accomplished in the game up until that point where he was identified as being ineligible and illegal, that still counts. Um, so it's not like, you know, the guy singled in the first inning and we go back and replay that or, you know, you know, there's still the onus on the visiting team to check the lineup card, make sure everyone's legal. Um, but now if it is identified after first pitch, that player and that manager are ejected uh, for the remainder of the game. Uh, question, Alec. Nolan Rodman asks, with the re-entry rule for D2, does that mean no pinch runners slash hitters? You can still pinch run. You can still pinch hit, but that is an official substitution. So if Alec goes in to pinch run for me, I'm done from the game now. So you, the, the pin, there's no, you know, um, there, 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 there's still the opportunity to pinch run, um, but it is an official substitution now. And uh, bear with me one second. Eric, do we have courtesy runners in D2? So there still is the opportunity to courtesy run, but there is, um, that is still eligible. You can still courtesy run for play people in D2. But the idea of, hey, we got a big lead. I'm going to put Alec in left field. And when that lead shrinks, I'm going to put Christian back in left field. You can't do that because Christian would then be done for the game upon that substitution. Good question. Um, where was I? Uh, rule 2308. Um, we have in, we have in our rules that if a D1 team playing a D2 team, uh, or if a D1 team, uh, forfeits to another D1 team, they lose their performance bond. Um, the question was, what if a D1 team is playing a D2 team and the D2 team forfeits, um, the D2 team lose their performance bond. And, and yes, that has been approved that now, you know, for D1 and D2 teams, if they forfeit, uh, a, a scheduled game, they lose their performance bond, and that performance bond goes to the regional budget of whoever is offended by that forfeit. So that could be a D1 performance bond going down to a D2 regional playoff if, uh, if a D1 team were to forfeit to a D2 team without playing. Um, a little bit about uh, streamlining our regional playoff process, our, our regional playoffs for D1 and D2, the four game playoff or four team playoffs. Um, there was a lot of debate on, um, on day two, do the winners, Brad, do the winners of day games one and two play game three or do they play game four? Um, and it was, it's in the past, they've mostly played. It's been that the winners of games one and two play game four of the regional playoff. Now it's been passed that they're going to play game three. So basically winners on Fridays, will come back, play first game on Saturday. The idea being Whoever loses that game does not have to play the immediate next game. Uh, sticking with the regional playoff theme, especially at the D1 level, um, within regionals for D1, the games are always scheduled as nine inning games. However, there's an opportunity if, if weather creates, if some sort of situation creates where, where the games need to be shortened to nine innings. It can be done if the regional director feels that's necessary in order to get the entire regional playoff tournament in. Um, there was a lot of debate on how do we get that consistent? You know, when games are seven, when games are nine, nine why one region is shortened and why one region has not. Um, one of the things we um, uh, did pass as a new rule is that if the, if if weather or other circumstances because we've had crazy circumstances we had this past year we had an active shooter at somewhere near the SOPAC regional in California that required us to not play any baseball on Friday um, so it's not always just weather is my point but uh, if there's a chance that uh, the regional playoffs get the schedule gets skewed and a team potentially could have to play three full games in one day, then all games scheduled for that day, whether that team competes in them or not, now move to a seven-inning format. Um, 
another thing with the regionals um in the past we've all you know it, it's kind of been um does the one seed play the early game on friday do they play the late game on friday uh it's been varied from region to region now it's going to be uniform where the first the number one seed actually gets their choice um who they play is not their choice that's all you know mathematically calculated but the number one seed going into regionals we get the choice do they want the earlier game friday or the later game friday um it was proposed that that we change our wording regarding performance bond loss that um that you know, teams could be hit for their performance bond for for sort of not arbitrary. Not arbitrary is not the right word, but you know, discretionary reasons. Um, if a team is just you know operating in a manner that we don't see fit, that we should be able to take their performance bond. We did not agree with that. We felt like because we're dealing with money, it should be a specifically stated reason why a performance bond could be lost. And um, so, for example. One of the things that was approved is, you know, failure to show up to a postseason is a loss of your performance bond. Um, it doesn't very, happen very often, but there's an example. If a team were to, to clinch their regionals and not go, their performance bond would be lost for that. Um, the movement of D2 regionals. I think Christian touched on it that last year we experimented with moving D2 regionals up a week earlier in april um it ended up uh not being as positive as we had saw as we would have liked because uh basically what we've done what we did was we shortened the spring season by a full weekend and that's often the best weekend of weather for a lot of teams so we've moved it back uh to the first weekend of may which will grant uh, everybody another weekend of conference play in the spring and hopefully more teams will get more more of their conference games played in if, if there's bad weather in D2. Um, on top of that, we had a rule in place in D2 where um, you to be postseason eligible, you had to compete in at least two non-conference games on top of your conference schedule just to be eligible. Meaning if you went 15-0 and 0 but didn't play any non-conference games, you still couldn't go to the regionals. Uh, that rule remains intact. However, it has been approved. It has been lowered to one. So teams now must play at least one non-conference game uh, in order to be eligible to make the regional playoffs. Another change in D2. Um, this is sort of with the, the growth and development of Division III, um, where we're trying to now make D2 a little bit more like D1. Um, we've changed our requirements for batter's helmets and coaches' helmets uh, in Division Two. They previously, it was basically you just had to have them. Now they must match in color. So no more at the D2 level, no more one guy coming up with a red helmet, one guy coming up with a blue helmet, one guy coming up with a green helmet. Uh, that everybody, all the all the players must have matching helmets. Um, base coaches for that team, m the base coach helmets must match each other too. Um, this is a rule we've had in Division One for years. Uh, it looks good. You know the finish, the, the 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 optics of the the product look great at Division One level. It looks uh, legitimate like college baseball, and we want to now bring that more to the D two level too, and hold them to higher standards. Uh, additionally, this year uh, with D two, D two teams are going to get their option of. Eight, eight batters helmets every year with their membership or a set of catcher's gear. So they're, they're going to have the opportunity if they don't already have matching helmets to just, hey, we're going to pick batters helmets this year and, and get ourselves in, in sync with these new rules. Uh, there was a uh, small rule change, wording change to rule 401, uh, you, uh, removing the word invitational. This is regarding, as Christian talked about before, how, how tournaments can become NCBA sanctioned in which <laughs> in which they can then count seven inning single games. Um, they, they were previously advertised as invitational tournaments. Now it's really any tournament. Uh, it doesn't have to be an invitational. Um, regarding, uh, there was a, a little bit of a, a rule change approved regarding the halted game rule. Um, basically, uh, in the instance where uh, a game is halted and it needs to be picked up, um, if the two teams don't, the next the next baseball they play with each other needs to be the finish of that first halted game, not the start of game two. You can't be like we played half a game one, it got halted. Now we're going to start game two, and 
and then we'll finish game one or start game two, play game three, then finish game one. No, the first thing that needs to happen is we finish game one. Um, in the event that the two teams don't do it that way, then whatever they played basically doesn't count and needs to be rescheduled until they do finish the halted game. Um, a, a rule that's going to be coming down the pipeline, you'll see it in the rule books. I'm sure it'll be highlighted and airmarked that it doesn't go into effect till the 1920 season, so it's not in effect this year. This is the D1 rule, but um, effective 1920, um, catcher's gear, color of catcher's gear must match the uniform or be white, black, or gray. So the idea being, again, we're talking about the optics of the league, looking legitimate to our fans, our spectators. Um, we get it. You know, some kids come out of high school, played at a high school that was purple. They have purple catcher's gear. Now they play for Colorado State, who's green and yellow, and they, they look, stand out like a sore thumb with their purple catcher's gear. Well, effective 1920, that purple catcher's gear, if you're on Colorado State, doesn't fly anymore. You need to be in white, black, gray, or whatever the team colors are. And again, the teams have the option to select catcher's gear as part of their membership every year. So by 1920, they'll have the opportunity to, to pick a, a new set of catcher's gear that's uh, in line with this. That same role is also going to go in effect in D2, but not till the 2021 season. All right. Well, that's it for the uh, update on our rules meeting that took place a couple weeks ago. Um, Christian, I'm sure we'll have the, the updated rule books out. Um, in the next few weeks and he'll have all the changes highlighted for everybody and we'll be good to go there so thank you very much i'm going to introduce christian and eric back to the podium they're going to tag team the next few slides